Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Regular Nintendo Com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Western Digital because someone has discovered a vulnerability in their My Cloud drives. This vulnerability is a rather alarming backdoor which is yet to be patched then we're going to move over to the risk v foundation specifically on comments from the foundation about the vulnerabilities and exploits in the x86 architecture particularly intel and then we're going to finish the video with a series of slides which have leaked concerning amd vega and the eighth generation mobile processors from intel and this actually reveals a hell of a lot of stuff even more specifications performance data and pretty much everything else you would wish to know so western digital are a behemoth when it comes to storage technology nowadays however they were originally founded back in 1970 in april don't you know which means they're almost 48 years old now back in the day they were starting the journey by selling calculator chips and this happened all the way through the early part of 1970s and then in the later part of the 1970s they um, decided to push multi-chip type of processors including chips which were for floppy drive controllers and much more besides but nowadays of course once again they are really well known for storage speaking of storage there's an issue with them because this isn't just a history lesson there is a back door which is in their my cloud personal network attached storage solutions and it's not particularly complex to access and fortunately this back door has supposedly existed for six months now and it was originally published and i'm going to try to pronounce the chap's name correctly james berske uh, that is b E R C E G A Y, and he is from the Golf Tech Research and Development. And as I said, he disclosed this to Western Digital back in June uh, 2017, but there is no patch or solution which have been deployed yet. And what this allows is that you can simply put in a very simple administrator password as well as a simple. Um, sorry, a simple username and a simple password, and then you get to log in with shell access. And there are many different drives which are plagued by these issues, including MyCloud Gen 2, MyCloud EX2, and EX2 Ultra, the PR2100, the PR4100, the EX4, the EX2100, the 4100, the DL2100, and finally the DL4100. So you're going to ask yourself, well, why did these research decide, hey, you know, we should just publish this now? I mean, after all, technically, if your drive is on a local area network and, of course, has internet access, then you technically could have your data compromised because you can have now um, commands which can be injected because, once again, you could technically uh, have access to the shell using once again a simple administrator username and password well their thought process was as follows eventually someone else is going to uh, run into this they're going to figure out what it is so hey if we put it in the cold hard light of day in theory western digital should release a patch so my personal opinion is don't put any super vulnerable data on these drives for example don't put you know your banking details that type of stuff instead if you do need it for those purposes then obviously disconnect it from the network which isn't exactly why you would want the drive in the first place given it was um created with the idea of a network attached solution but hey here we are next up we got going to discuss the press release from the risk v foundation it's a pretty lengthy one so i'll go through the pertinent parts and of course, reference Meltdown Inspector. They say that these vulnerabilities are particularly troubling as they are not due to a bug in a particular process implementation, but are consequences of a widespread technique of speculative execution. Many generations of processors with different ISIS and from different manufacturers are susceptible to these attacks, which exploits the fact that instructions speculatively executed on incorrect predicted code paths leave vulnerable observation changes and microarchitecture states. Even though the instructions, architectural state changes will be undone once the branch prediction has found to be incorrect. 
No announced Risk V. Silicon is susceptible, and the popular open source Risk V rocket process is unaffected as it does not perform memory access speculatively. And then, with their press statement, of course, it's well within their right to do so, they decided to tout the benefits of their particular community and project, or foundation, I suppose. In fact, they finish with Together we are unleashing a new innovative frontier by developing the extensible Risk V ISA available for use in micro architecture incarnations across all forms of computing devices. There are a couple of things there. I do wonder when they say, and I quote, as we power up more intelligence everywhere, we need to develop a new robust security approach instead of papering over cracks in existing designs. What we're going to be seeing change in x86. After all, some might say, well, x86 is somewhat aging now, and that's true. After all, Intel themselves do want to retire and have retired some of the older instructions. After all, how many applications are going to be doing that, and even older instructions, you can basically get around that by emulating it in software, because, well, you know, CPUs of an application that was designed like 20 years ago, it's not that big of a deal to emulate that in software, let's just be honest. But unfortunately... I do agree that this isn't necessarily a bug in design. It just is simply that when they were designing these processes, they weren't designing them with the thought process of this side attack in mind. In other words, it was more, well, we're designing this for pure performance. We're not designing this with the idea that someone could possibly attack it. So I suppose technically it's not really a flaw in the design because the design is doing what it's supposed to. It is speeding up instructions, but it left essentially a vulnerability. So obviously in the case of the Risk V Foundation, they're pointing out, well, we don't have this vulnerability and my personal opinion on all of this, and I'm sure anyone would agree, even the folks at Intel themselves, it's going to be very interesting how the next three, four, five years plays out in the CPU arena. And finally, we're going to discuss the Intel 8th generation core with Radeon RX Vega graphics because the presentation has leaked. As far as I'm aware, the first website which put this out was videocards.com. However, it has since been grabbed to other websites. I don't know which was the first. I believe it was videocards.com, but I can't be 100% certain. However, I will link this plus other sources, of course, in the video description. So we'll start out with the slide, which reads 8th generation Intel Core processor mobile positioning and it does indeed have u g and h we all know what those stand for if you've been following intel's processors for any length of time u represents mainstream mobility and of course they point out that this is thin and light immersive entertainment non battery love and integrated intel u h d graphics g is representing Intel's high-performance mobile enthusiast CPU and, of course, is the first consumer EMIB and HPM2 discrete graphics on package power sharing and enthusiast gaming and VR experience, innovative uh, content creation, uh, sorry, advanced content creation and innovative designs. And finally, the H is high performance. Uh, once again, it is the high-end mobile enthusiast CPU. Uh, CPU attached discrete graphics for consumer, 4K gaming, professional content creation, and finally mega mo uh, tasking. You'll notice that AMD's contribution there is not noticed until we get to the next slide, and that's where we see 8th gen Intel Core with Radeon. And what we have here is some details. Uh, some of these we discussed yesterday, but there is some more advanced stuff in just a moment. First 8th generation Intel Core H series in market more to come which is quite important first implementation of power sharing across cpu and gpu so basically if the gpu is going to be hoovering up a lot of power for example you're playing a game then obviously it will get a larger chunk of the power budget or vice versa first consumer solution to use intel emib first consumer mobile solution to use hbm2 and it is indeed a quite interesting design choice and obviously they've done that for power and size constraints next level performance in sleek thin and light systems uh there is overclocking available for the cpu gpu and hpm i'm going to be curious to see how well that does in the real world a couple of notes for the next slide 8 gen of pc express gen 3 is connected between the cpu and gpu and of course that is for the workloads between the two and hpm according to this anyway utilizes 50% less power than GDDR5, 
and indeed they do show what dynamic power sharing does you can see the frames per second by enabling it you're looking at almost 20% performance increase in Doom and Tomb Raider is looking to be about the 15% mark as well as Fallout 4. And then the next slide down as well, well the next couple of slides we have some interesting specifications, high bandwidth cache, 4 gigabyte capacity so once again this is confirming yesterday's information, 1024 bit bus width, 24 compute units, asynchronous dispatch, this is all pretty much all um, similar stuff to what you'd expect with Vega. Indeed, it has 16 render backends and 64 pixels a clock. And in the next slide after that, you can see once again that they are pushing the fact that there are two graphics subsystems on the same package, which provides users the ability to have Intel's quick sync video. The next one, however, the next slide, sorry, is very interesting because we have final clarification on the specifications. So the clock speeds are up to 4.1 gigahertz, four cores, eight threads. That stuff's been known from the day dot. Uh, base clock of 931 megahertz and boosts up to 1011. I'd like to point out that that's very impressive given the sheer size of this package. And it does indeed have 179 gigabytes per second of memory memory bandwidth, excuse me, and four gigabytes capacity. So the memory bandwidth is basically the same as the PS4 base model. Now bear in mind, this is the Vega MGL graphics. So we'll get to the slightly higher end version in just a moment, which has 24 compute units. You'll notice this has just 20 compute units. But in Vermintide 2, you're looking at 15 frames a second on a three-year-old i7-4720HQ, and that is compared with a sorry paired with a GTX 950. So now it goes up to 47 frames a second, so you're looking at about three times the performance, which is very impressive indeed. Adobe Premiere Pro with Creative Cloud, on the other hand, the render times drop considerably and you're looking at almost a three minute saving or if you prefer 40 percent faster fortunately hand hand break excuse me definitely it's considerably better almost seven times faster and in the next slide down we have a comparison against a gtx 1050 and it's looking once again of course it does depend upon the game but around 30 40 percent faster seems to be pretty typical with vermintide 2 being the outlier at just 10 percent faster but let's face it uh dlc mankind divided you're looking at 27 frames a second compared to 36 frames a second that's well within playability and Hitman, 33 frames a second, 46 frames a second. That's pretty damn impressive indeed. The RX Vega MGH, however, is the bigger brother. The clock speed of the processor has been nudged up another 100 megahertz. Woohoo! Way! Okay, maybe slightly exaggerating. It's not exactly a big deal. But hey, anything helps, right? But it's the clock speed of the GPU as well as the compute units, which really are the story here. 1190 megahertz on the boost base of uh, 1063 with 24 compute units. That means that this thing puts out about 3.65 teflops of computing performance, which is absolutely pretty damn immense. To put that into some level of perspective, this particular GPU has about twice the amount of teflops as, as excuse me the PS4 this is the vanilla system and thus vastly outperforms the base Xbox One. It does indeed come with slightly higher memory bandwidth. It has 204 gigabytes per second. However, it is unlocked, so you should be able to tweak this. I do wonder what the average clock speeds are going to be for both HBM2 as well as the uh, GPU. Uh, not so much about the CPU, because I think that, to be honest with you, that's absolutely plenty. But I do wonder what's left in the tank with the GPU and the HBM2. I suspect in overclocking the HBM2 in particular is going to offer quite a performance boost. Finally, what type of performance benefits do you have against a GTX 960? Well, honestly, it does, of course, depend upon the game, but around 2.5 times to 2 times, depending on the game, seems pretty typical. It looks like, for example, Rise of the Tomb Raider is more than playable at 62 frames a second. And according to the last slide, because you'll notice that resolution and details are not listed on any of these, well, Rise of the Tomb Raider is running at 1080p, as are... Uh, as is, excuse me, Vermintide 2, DLSX Mankind 
uh, divided and these are with the high settings and average frame rates are measured and also Hitman as well is running at 1080p on high settings. But perhaps for me, the really, really crucial thing is the comparison against the GTX 1060 with the Max-Q, which has, of course, 6 gigabytes of RAM. Now, the reason I say that this is the most crucial is quite simple, because what we have here is confirmation that this particular configuration is faster than the GTX 1060. Is it much faster? No, but it's around 7% to 13%. So in, for example, Hitman, you're looking at 57 frames a second versus 62 frames a second, or in the case of uh, Deus Ex, which is the fast, which is the highest uh, performance difference, uh, 43 versus 49. So it's not quite lock 60, but hey, that's 1080p with pretty much all the visual settings cranked up. You can't really complain at all, at least in my opinion. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.